Now this is the kind of seed I like. Easy to handle, easy to germinate, and don't care very much about extreme temperatures viable for centuries. This is Nolumbo nucifera. Well, maybe. It's some kind of Nolumbo, probably. I'll get to that discrepancy in a moment. But first, let's dive straight into germination. As always, check the description below for a link to the research report. If you throw some Nolumbo seeds into water, likely nothing will happen, even if you wait for years. That's because Nolumbo live their entire lives in water, so hydration in and of itself isn't a good environmental cue for germination. They need something else as a trigger, something like being hit with a hammer. Maybe that isn't the most natural cue. There weren't many hammers 135 million years ago when Nolumbo evolved. Also, seeds aren't the only method of Nolumbo propagation but they are the only subject of this video. I will talk about rhizomes if and when I get some. Nicifera rely on a hard, impermeable seed coat that must be broken to allow water to infiltrate. That's the germination cue. The seed coat is actually a fused pericarp and seed coat, kind of like a corn kernel. I'll be referring to it as a seed coat for brevity. Now, you can break the coat with a hammer or a bench vise, but I don't recommend it. There are easier ways to not smash fingers or plant embryos. Some people use a sharp knife to whittle away a thin layer off the top of the seed. My lack of whittling skills are proved by the scars on my hand, so I'm not going to do that. I suppose you could use chromic acid like you are still in the 1920s, but definitely don't do that. I hear hexavalent chromium isn't that good for you. Soaking the seeds in ether to remove the water-repellent waxes seems to work, but I prefer to stay away from flammable solvents when possible. The lotus seeds are edible, so I suppose you could just start chewing on them until the seed coat cracks, though this is probably best reserved for green seeds directly from the pod, taken before they acquire their hardened shell through drying. Plus, there's no telling where your seeds have been, so maybe don't suck on them. Probably the most practical method is abrasion, simply sanding or filing away the seed coat until you expose the off-white cotyledon underneath. 60 or 120 grit sandpaper can make short work of the seed coat. This is similar to what occurs in nature, but at a much faster pace. Sediment and water currents slowly abrade the seed coat over many years, if not centuries. Microorganisms, specifically those that produce cellulase, might help break down the seed coat in nature as well. Though Nolumbo are quite resistant to microbial degradation, some seeds have survived for over a thousand years in lake beds. If you choose the abrasive method, Sanding the little indentation at the end might accelerate germination slightly, but the total germination rate is the same regardless. Abrading the end with the protuberance runs the greatest risk of permanent damage. Inside the seed, this is the area where the cotyledons directly attach to the seed coat, so there is less margin for error. This risk is probably minor though, since some researchers peel the entire seed coat manually without any germination issues. Just don't go overboard with a belt sander or something. After a day or two of soaking, any small break in the seed coat will expand from hydrostatic pressure anyway. One final method, and the one that I chose, is acid scarification. Concentrated sulfuric acid is very good at breaking down organic material. This includes seed coats as well as contaminating microorganisms, a double win. I don't recommend using sulfuric acid unless you have previous chemistry experience. After all, you are also composed of organic material. Sulfuric acid can be used to treat a large number of seeds at the same time in a controlled manner, which is why I wanted to try it out now for preparation for future work. It is also a favorite among botany researchers for the same reasons. Anyway, the concentration and timing of sulfuric acid treatment is important. Too concentrated for too long results in damage to the embryo. Too dilute for too short won't be enough to break physical dormancy. I chose to soak my Nolumbo seed in about 5 milliliters of concentrated sulfuric acid for 4 hours, followed by extensive rinsing. If you would like to read more on the acceptable protocol variations, check out the references below. This method can even be done by seed producers in an advanced treatment before drying and storage. Then the buyer can simply sow the seeds without having to whack them with a hammer or whatever. This will limit the storage life of the seeds to a modest 2-3 to three years, however. In any case, just use the method that you are most comfortable with. 
the limbo have excellent germination, regardless of the method used to break the seed coat. Even 1,300-year-old seeds with extensive radiation damage have a 67% germination rate. So if you get anything substantially below total germination, something is probably wrong with your methods. The only caveat here is that sometimes seeds do not contain a viable embryo. These embryos may not have fully matured, or they may have atrophied sometime later. This is more common for rhizome cultivars, or if the mother plant is particularly self-incompatible and fertilized from a pure genetic stand. The outside appearance of Nolombo seeds is largely determined by the cotyledons, which have a different developmental process than the embryo, so it can be difficult to distinguish viable from non-viable seeds by cursory inspection. Typically, immature or otherwise damaged seeds are distinguished from a mature one by a float test. However, the limbo ovules develop in such a way as to leave a small air cavity inside the mature seed, so even viable seeds can float. This little air pocket seems to be integral to the seed's dissemination and growth, and it, as its removal inhibits germination. As the limbo absorb water, after scarification, they can sink, then float, then sink again, and this varies with the age of the seeds. So a float test isn't a guaranteed method of removing non-viable seeds. All viable seeds will eventually sink, however. If your seeds are still floating after a couple of days, they may not be viable. Alternatively, your scarification method could have been insufficient to break dormancy. You can determine this for certain by weighing the seeds before and after soaking. A properly scarified seed will gain water weight, whereas an improper one will not. This is how physical dormancy is identified in the lab. At this point, you could deposit the scarified seeds into a suitable outdoor habitat, if that is your final goal. Any body of water less than 50 centimeters deep with good sunlight exposure is ideal. The lumbo take over ponds and small lakes to the point where they become somewhat of a nuisance plant, so choose wisely. If not outdoors, a wide bowl or small fish tank serves as a suitable seedling habitat. Germination rate is largely independent of temperature, between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius. Growth below 15 degrees Celsius is severely limited, and no germination occurs at 10 degrees Celsius. I'm not going to get into the ideal long-term growing conditions in this first video. However, I do recommend using a grow light or germinating them in full sun. Nilumbo have a rare ability. Their embryos contain fully formed chloroplasts. When germinated, these seeds can immediately begin photosynthesizing and generating oxygen, greatly extending their ability to thrive in hypoxic water. They can use basically as much light as you can give them, up to and surpassing noonday sunlight at the equator. Dark green leaf stalks and abundant roots are a sign of sufficient lighting. If the petioles are light green or white, a supplemental grow light is probably a good addition. As a seedling develops, you should see two to four leaves and some new roots emerge. Then all growth will seemingly stop. Don't panic. This is normal. The plant has now consumed most of the stored nutrients in the cotyledons and is quietly adapting to its new environment. Keep the water level steady and wait for growth to resume in a couple of weeks. Once you start to see new shoots developing, you can transplant their nilumbo to their forever home. Also, your seedlings do not require fertilizer and using it will likely harm the nilumbo or lead to algae growth. And with that, your nilumbo nocifera should be off to a great start. That is, however, if your seeds are actually Nilumbo nucifera. I told you we would get to it. There are only two extant species of Nilumbo, Ludia and Nucifera. Nucifera is native to Southeast Asia. The flowers are red, pink, or white. Ludia is native to the Americas and typically has yellow flowers. From those two species, hundreds of cultivars have been bred. Some are selected for edible rhizome or seed production. Some are selected for various floral traits like color or petal number. There are even some dwarf varieties well suited for home water features and fish tanks. However, this, this is a problem. Blue Nilumbo does not exist. There are white, red, yellow, and combinations thereof, but never blue. Color mixtures are easy to breed, and entirely new pigment is not, especially not blue, which is one of the least common colors in nature. So how was I sold this impossible blue Nilumbo? I think the confusion arose from the association of Nilumbo nucifera with the actually blue Nymphaea cerulea. Both are colloquially known as lotus, and they share some superficial morphology. 
They are both aquatic macrophytes with showy flowers. Both genera produce psychoactive alkaloids, namely aporphines, and are therefore much sought after for their purported medical benefits. But that's about where the similarity ends. Genetically speaking, Nalumbo are actually more closely related to sycamore and macadamia trees than they are to nymphaea. To be sure, the nomenclature and taxonomy is muddled, even in the scientific literature. That happens all the time. But nowhere in the extensive literature is Nalumbo ever noted to produce blue pigments. It seems that some unscrupulous plant sellers have taken advantage of the blue color as an indication that their seeds are special and potent, and thus demand a higher price. The blue nymphaea cerulea is depicted in some ancient Egyptian art in a psychoactive or spiritual context. As I said, there are some potentially psychoactive substances produced by nymphaea and nalumbo, though I do find it somewhat funny that the leaves of nalumbo have up to six times the concentration of alkaloids compared to the flowers, so anyone attempting to sell maximum potency blue nalumbo flowers is doubly wrong. To some, I believe that the association of the blue color with psychoactivity, mixed with the general confounding terminology of Nalumbo lotus and Nymphaea lily, gave rise to this fictitious blue Nalumbo nucifera that I supposedly have now. If you get confused, it is actually easier to distinguish a Nymphaea from a Nalumbo by leaf structure. Nalumbo leaves are entirely circular. Nymphaea leaves have a notch cut into them, sort of like Pac-Man. Anyway, I brought this flower color discrepancy to the attention of my seed supplier after my purchase. They remain firm in their belief that they have a blue nucifera, despite never having grown the third party seeds themselves. I did some investigating and found that the image they feature in the listing not only shows indication of digital alteration, but is also used in dozens of other listings on disparate websites. Changing a pink flower to a blue one and vice versa is fairly easy with free image manipulation software. Though it seems that someone neglected to color in all of the flowers here. Now I'm not a digital forensic scientist nor a botanist. Maybe there is a single pond on a small farm in Nepal that has the only blue Nalumbo in existence. One that is entirely unknown to science. I guess we will have to wait and see. It might be two or three years before my seeds produce flowers at all. Maybe that's why no one ever complained to the distributor. I hope it is a blue lotus. Blue pigments would be worth millions of dollars to the color-starved lotus flower industry. Science isn't cheap, and that would really put a dent in the overhead. I am reasonably sure that the seeds I bought are in the genus Nalumbo. Their morphology matches the descriptions from the literature, though mine are rather small. That likely just indicates that the mother plant was somewhat undernourished, leading to undersized cotyledons. Alternatively, these seeds could have been stored somewhere exceptionally dry for a long period of time. Regardless of the flower color that I actually have, all Nalumbo have similar seedling growth conditions and development, so the instructions from this video will still be applicable. As I mentioned before, if you are growing for alkaloids, it is the leaves that are important, not the flowers though the latter can be used as a means to identify a specific potent cultivar. I'll get to that in a different video. Side note, this has nothing to do with the genus Lotus in the Fabaceae family. Those are completely separate land plants with an unfortunate name. Nor am I talking about the species Nymphaea Lotus. See what I mean about confused nomenclature? Anyway, uh, enough of ranting. Go forth and multiply your lotus.